This is the open on Vienna Bloomberg. I'm John Ehrlichman. We're about 15 minutes away from the start of trading this morning. We'll see how technology stocks perform. They've had a huge year because everybody's trying to figure out where technology and AI is taking us, and we know technology stocks are probably best position to capitalize on that. But thinking about the future, it's amazing when you look back in history at some of the predictions that have been made. AT&T, I don't know if you've ever seen these commercials online going back to the early 90s where they predicted just about everything, smartwatches, tablets, eBooks, video conferencing. And now we look back at those things and say, okay, I guess we should have seen it coming. These days, obviously we're trying to figure out where technology is taking us and we're delighted here live at Collision to have from AT&T, the company's chief technology officer, Jeremy Legg, joining us. And Jeremy, you were involved in making those predictions back in the early 90s. But A little before my time, yeah. <laughs> but those are really amazing to look at. And I think that is the promise of, and excitement that comes with looking ahead at what is possible. What are you thinking about? Welcome to Collision, by the way. What are yeah, you thinking you. about in this trip to the, to the big conference? Well, I think, I think this year, obviously, with generative AI coming about, that that's become you know, kind of the talk of the world. And it does feel as though we're at one of those seminal moments that comes every 15, 20 years where you're going to see a big technology shift. And while AI's been around for a long time, AI uh, at AT&T has been around for a long time, we're one of the larger holders of patents in that, in that space, the generative AI piece is different because its starting point is essentially everything on the internet. So you're, you've got out of the box capabilities with the amount of knowledge that sits on the internet. And so the fascinating thing now is, is that it's the data that's not on the internet that becomes the proprietary interesting stuff that you plug into generative AI in order to, to really gain some insights. So, so it almost sounds to me like there's, there's two lanes here for you. There's how it gets used within your business, but because through your business, you're serving people who are accessing this data everywhere, yeah. that you're going to be monitoring how they're using AI as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've already actually deployed uh, generative AI through our online chat capabilities where the, the interactions with customers are automated and it's actually quite remarkable the difference in that AI versus other AIs. But then we're also using it internally, looking at our network data, looking at our finances, looking at you know, our contracts and supply chains and all kinds of other things. So essentially anything that has a massive data set uh, is just primed to run through generative AI and you're really limited only by the computing power on the back end. And AI doesn't get tired, um, it, it doesn't ask for a raise, <laughs> it, right. it, uh, it, it just kind of runs and runs. So it's going to be a transformative technology for us as well as I think for the world. You know, it's interesting, we have a lot of people who tune in who are laser focused on investing and they hear about the hype and they see what's happening with stock prices and you're not here to be a, a stock analyst or a portfolio no. manager, but being at the center of this change, I mean, does it feel like the real deal to you? You, you mentioned the, this, these kinds of changes don't come around every day. Yeah, No, I think it is the real deal, I, I really do, and I've been involved with these technologies for a number of years. I think there, there's, there's kind of two camps emerging. So you have more, I don't want to call it proprietary AI, but the things that Google and Microsoft are doing with their products, but then you have a rising open source community that a lot of people are now beginning to play in, and lots of startups are beginning to play in in that space. And over time, I think there's actually, you know, a lot of the focus now is on the competition between Microsoft and Google and other major technology companies. I actually think the rise of open source is going to be one of the more interesting things to watch over the next number of years because you're going to have, you know, all of the different communities around the world having access to that, whereas on the proprietary side, you know, those, the access is going to be more limited to the companies that own that technology. Very interesting, and you know, this, we're at a global conference. You are a US, but you know, in many ways, a global business as yeah. well. Um, you know, what do you think are some of the early building blocks of having a conversation? Because, for example, there will be government leaders here this week yeah. talking about how to navigate around AI and the risks around it. Does there need to be almost sort of a, a complementary relationship between business and government? Because we're all figuring this all out at the same time. I do believe that. All right. I think there are, there are things that corporations can do responsibly right now as the grander policies are designed by, by governments, but I do believe it needs to be collaborative. You can put guardrails in place for a lot of this AI technology now. 
You can make sure that it's not violating patents. You can make sure that you know, the legal components that are coming out of this aren't exposing trade secrets and things like that. You can create instances of the technology to keep your data safe. Um, so there are ways to, to you know, just general corporate responsibility things that we've already done and other corporations are doing. But the impacts to broader society and what's going to happen because of these technologies, that's going to have to be worked out in, in public-private par uh, public partnerships. Okay, so you have worked within the, the world of technology for a long time. Yeah. We started the conversation by looking back at some of the predictions from year ago, uh, years ago. Obviously, everybody's talking AI. What's something else that you're thinking about right now that maybe people are talking a little bit less about, but, but will matter to our future? Well, I think, I think there's a number of things, right? Uh, the first is what 5G is ultimately going to do and how that technology is evolving. You know, right now, the main thing people have seen is I had to go buy a new phone because I needed a new chip. Um, but the technologies that are going to begin to be deployed around um, autonomous driving, around connected cars, all of the devices that are going to be connected in the home, we think there's going to be about 3x more connected devices over the next number of years consumption patterns in the home are going to double over the next number of years. Family home consume eight to 900 gig a month. That's, for the non-technical, that's a lot of data. Yeah. Um, and so you're just going to begin to see consumption patterns that are going to be much broader than what you saw before, but the ability to have specialized services to individual consumers and businesses out of 5G. And, and that's something there's been a lot of talk about 5G, yeah. but that hasn't rolled out yet. And as we're rolling out C-band, as we're rolling out cloud native technologies for 5G, that's what's going to come in the next number of years that people will really notice. Okay. Well